Hello and welcome to the screencast for Political Philosophy Lehman College, Spring 2020. This time we'll be talking about Chapter 3 or Lecture 3 of John Dewey's Liberalism and Political Action. But first, let's take a brief review of the first chapter and then I'll give you another brief overview of chapter two, which we are required to read in this course. This is a long chapter, plus the review and the overview, so I'm gonna probably split this into two videos. In the first chapter, and remember he gave this as a series of lectures, so I always remind you of that by saying it's a chapter for us, but it was a lecture as he gave it. And we saw this in the previous videos, Chapter 1, Dewey traced the history of classical liberalism from its beginnings, or at least the relevant beginnings to us that Dewey argued for in Locke, to the modern world. And he's giving this lecture to call in 1935. So 1935 is a world that's a lot like ours, but also very different to ours. So one exercise we might want to do is think about what's changed in the interim. Back to chapter one. He argued that classical liberalism, which had everybody as a preformed individualistic unit who deserved as much liberty as possible, the government was there to ensure that personal individual liberties were respected. That this classical liberalism was rooted in an ideology that from a bygone world. The Industrial Revolution happened and nothing is really the same. The way we produce things, the way we consume things, the way we live, the way we work, who has power, who has wealth, who has access to what, everything's different. And in the tradition of Western philosophy, sometimes we present our, we see philosophers who present their ideas as an immutable truth as opposed to something that is historically rooted in a time and a place. Dewey, of course, thinks ideologies or systems of theory that affect how we run our everyday lives are always historically contextual and culturally contextual. They aren't immutable truths forever. And of course, pre-industrial revolution, John Locke's time, the production and consumption of goods was mostly an individual thing. It was done on a one-on-one -on -one basis or very, very small groups. Additionally, of course, Locke was aiming his arguments at a specific government, at a specific time, and a specific place. He was arguing that the way monarchical and elite power was usurping the private property of other wealthy individuals. So Locke's arguments were aimed at a specific target. What sort of target should we be aiming at now? Well, for one, Dewey tells us in chapter one, we're not really an agrarian society any longer, obviously. We don't have these one-to-one -one creations and transactions. Uh, we are an industrial society. We are a technological scientific society. And of course now, 105 years later, we are an information society, a service society. Think of other things you might be able to add as what has changed in the interim. Dewey tells us free market capitalism rose up in power in conjunction at the same time as the Industrial Revolution was happening, and the free market economists appropriate appropriated ideas from classical liberalism for itself. It took the idea of economic man, so-called, meaning that individualistic unit that makes economic and social and political choices in a rationally self-interested way. And it sort of replaced other ideas of what liberty and freedom were. So economic man became this individual unit of society and the one upon whom these individual rights are part of. Uh, Dewey says, in fact, 
the economic aspects of life usurped or took over every other way of living, dominated the government, dominated the way we interact with one another, dominated the way we live, the way we worked. But this is a historical contingent fact, and it doesn't have to be that way. And it ends up disenfranchising most of the population. The capitalistic class, and that means people who own the capital, people who own the uh, the industries. They're the capitalistic class and we all are disenfranchised. We have less power, we have less freedom, we have less opportunity. And Dewey says, well, to change this, to make more people have the opportunity to be truly free. So liberalism, remember, the root is we want individual liberty. True liberalism, true liberty, Dewey says, we need better social institutions. And even though capitalism and the economic aspects of life came to dominate government, there were other strains that were still arguing against it. We talked about that in the first couple of lectures. And this new strain came up to think, well, okay, um, there are certain things the population needs to flourish, and if we don't have them, we won't flourish, and it's the government's job to provide them. If you took a look at FDR's fireside chat, you can see that his New Deal or his New Deals is sort of one of the very first expressions in the United States of this idea that it's the government's job to protect our basic needs so we can flourish. And those are social institutions. Chapter two, or lecture two again, which you were not assigned, takes this historical story and tries to bring it up to Dewey's positive argument. He takes this place where there are two strains of liberalism, this free market capitalistic idea of classical liberalism and this second strain of liberalism which realizes we need some kind of social organization to better life for most people and says there's a crisis because these two things are always butting heads they are fundamentally different to one another um, and it's made a lot of people feel insecure or uh, overwhelmed with the direction society is taking. So he argues that if the ideas behind liberalism are that it's the government's job to create citizens that are as free as possible or as highly flourishing as possible uh, and we want to make this government relevant to modern industrial life, we have to recognize this split. Dewey says life and freedom are more than economic life and freedom. We have a lot of other things we value, relationships, learning, art, music, tons of stuff, spirituality. There are many other kinds of value in human life and we need to recognize that to flourish, an individual needs all of them, not just a steady economic life. He also thinks individuals aren't ready-made, like quote-unquote economic man would have us believe. Individuals are a process, uh, and the quality of life for any particular individual, the quality of the freedom for any particular individual, is inextricably bound to the environments that they live in. And if your environment cares only about the economic aspect of your life, you're suffering. You're not fully individual. You're not fulfilling the potential of humanity inside of yourself. Furthermore, Dewey says in chapter two, that science and technology are the real drivers of progress and change in the economy, not capitalistic laws. And if that's the case, then he makes an argument for it. He doesn't just state it out loud without an argument, but we're not going to worry too much about it since we didn't read this chapter. Uh, he says, 
if science and technology are the real drivers of progress and change in the world, why not use their methodology to try and improve social, political, and governmental life as well? And that's going to end up being his ultimate conclusion at the end of chapter three as well. And that the real legacy of the free market economy is to funnel every single kind of capital into the hands of the wealthy. And I emphasize all kinds of capital because there I mean intellectual capital, creative capital. Um, everything that a human being can possibly produce gets funneled into the economic system, which gets further funneled into a very small number of hands. And again, Dewey doesn't think that that's what it means to create a world in which most people have the opportunity to flourish as highly as they possibly can, to have the most freedom or liberty that they possibly can. Here's a quote on page 46. He says, the inchoate state of social knowledge is reflected in the two fields where intelligence might be supposed to be most alert and most continuously active education, and the formation of social policies in legislation. And so it means incoherent, chaotic, um, meaning that where we had a rapid growth in our knowledge about the natural world, physics, and mathematics, biology, chemistry, social knowledge, how we organize ourselves in our lives, didn't have any sort of the same kind of progress. And if we were to have progress in social knowledge about ourselves and how we organize our own societies and how we live, we'd see it in the way we educate people. We'd see it in the way we propose social policies and legislation, but we don't because we don't have that kind of communal, commonly available social knowledge. And he cautions that we don't want mechanization in education meaning rote learning, uh, taking technology and using it as a replacement for critical thought. When he says he wants the methods of science and technology, he wants to create citizens and individuals who, are, who have minds that are constantly experimenting, that don't rely on this notion of getting to an eternal truth and then stopping always seeing how we can change things to improve the lives of individuals and community as a whole. On page 53, he says, the crisis in liberalism, as I said at the outset, proceeds from the fact that after early liberalism had done its work, society faced a new problem, that of social organization. Its work was to liberate a group of individuals representing the new science and the new forces of productivity from customs, ways of thinking, institutions that were oppressive of the new modes of social action. Okay, so what does he mean here? He's saying we had this industrial revolution uh, in part due to the methods of science and technology. There are new ways of producing, of course, these massive scaled industries that um, nothing like the old farming and artisan ways. So all of those things changed, but our customs, our ways of thinking, our institutions, none of them changed commensurately in the same time in response to all those scientific and technological changes. And we need that. That's what he thinks the crisis in liberalism is. We need to release our old ways of thinking, our old customs, our old social institutions from some idea that they're idealistic truths and recognize that they need to change as much as the forces of production have. So then we come to today's material, chapter or lecture three, and here is Dewey's introduction. This chapter is called Renaissance Liberalism. I also like pronouncing it Renaissance because I think it gives the two flavors of what Dewey's aims are here in this cha chapter. Renaissance isn't a word that's used very frequently. It means renewed, 
nascent means at beginnings or at birth. Whereas if we pronounce it renaissance too, we could think of it as a renaissance for liberalism. So a renaissance, a rebirth, uh, something new that is responding to current political, social, scientific conditions. And in it, Dewey argues for how a new direction of liberalism should proceed and why. First, he tells us that change happens no matter what. It's just a permanent feature of human life. All we can do is figure out how to best direct that change. Here he says on page 56, liberalism is committed to an end that is at once enduring and flexible. The liberation of individuals so that the realization of their capacities may be the law of their life. So you don't have to struggle to realize your capacities against social institutions that are shutting you down because they're not economically focused, perhaps. Instead, as this renascent liberal, we should be committed to the idea that we should change the world around as need be to help people realize their potentials. So what do we have to do to get there? Dewey says we have to, quote unquote, free intelligence. But he doesn't mean intelligence in the same way we might mean it, meaning the capacity of a single individual to critically think or to learn, or to know or to grow. He means a very specific kind of intelligence that we're gonna detail for the rest of this and the next lecture. And I think, well, we'll do one more slide here. We'll end this video and then I'll do a part two. So he situates liberalism, this renascent new idea of liberalism, as in between two extremes. There is conservative Victorianism. That's the way our social institutions are now. They are economically focused. They are they have the idea built into them that this Lockean ideal of personal property is the fundamental explainer for individual human liberty. And it wants to stay the same. It wants to have the same institutions. It wants to keep the status quo as it is. Then on the other extreme, there are Marxist revolutionaries. Now, we'll read Marx next week. And you can see if you think then that Dewey characterizes him in an accurate light. But the way he does characterize him is the other side of the extremism. Dewey says both camps think change will be sudden when it happens. Dewey says it's not that we have to work for change. And that's what the focus of the new liberalism will be. Marxist revolutionaries think that there'll be a class war and then magically there won't be class struggle anymore. Conservative Victorians often situate happiness of a humankind in an afterlife. So, and such, it's not our job to ensure it necessarily at, in the material world as we're alive. One underlying issue that makes people tend toward one extreme or the other is that for a very long time in human life, we were ruled by scarcity. Now, I want to situate this a little bit historically for you. I think Dewey would approve. Uh, he's ready in 1935 when Darwin's ideas of evolution were still pretty brand new. It's just a generation after Darwin and many, many, many thinkers in all fields often used natural selection and evolution as an example. Sometimes comparison was better, sometimes it was worse. For this, I'll let you judge yourself. Um, <clears throat> this is pretty basic biology. 
The idea is to live. You need a certain set of goods. You need food, water, oxygen, shelter. For us as social creatures, probably companionship. And that is scarce. We have to compete for it. And since that's such a major driver of our behaviors, oftentimes it can shape the entire way we represent ourselves, the entire way we structure and organize our lives. But Dewey says we have had a lot of scientific and technological progress, and if we didn't have an imbalance in equality with wealth, uh, we'd probably be able to take care of that scarcity for everyone on the planet. It could be a thing of the past, but we artificially reinforce it through unequal economic structures. Insecurity is a quote-unquote child of scarcity, meaning that that's one of the reasons we can be manipulated into thinking the status quo is the only eternal way to be, because we're insecure. We might not really have material scarcity in our lives, but we're still biologically terrified of it. And a third thing that's relevant to pushing people to one extreme or the other are the patterns in which we live. And these things, these patterns are so important to doing because when we're born into a world, it shapes how we look at the world, how we look at our own personal possibilities, what we think our goals should be, what our dreams are, what uh, possibilities we think we have, what possibilities for the world we think there are. So if somebody says something about living communally and you're born into a world where that just isn't done, you are going to have a belief that that living communally is weird or an extreme. But that view doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I just picked that at random. It could be any type of organization of society that's different to the one that we have today. So, okay, there are these three underlying issues that Dewey thinks push people to the extremes of conservative Victorianism or Marxist revolution. But he thinks we can alter all three of them for people with social intelligence. And that's what I'm going to call his special definition of intelligence that I mentioned in the last slide over here. There's a, we have free social intelligence. And again, we'll develop the definition of what that means throughout the rest of the chapter. This is getting to be just about the right amount of time for part A. So as always, please email me, ask below in the comments, or go onto Blackboard to one of the discussion boards and ask me questions, comments, and I will see you for the last half of chapter three in part 